Uh, okay, let's can I share my screen. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Earhart. I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and for the last 10 years, I've been a Drupal developer, and I'm on the autism spectrum, but I didn't know that until about two years ago. I'm going to explain autism a little bit, talk about my challenges, my strengths, and hopefully you'll learn something about those of us whose brains are a little different. They say if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. That's because it's a spectrum. People are affected in various ways and to varying degrees. Some are nonverbal, but they might be able to communicate with a text-to-speech device. Carly Fleischman was one such person who's done several interviews with celebrities and also once interviewed Stephen Colbert on his show a few years ago. Some seem to be minimally affected, but learn to wear a mask, acting like the neurotypical people around them. According to the National Symposium on Neurodiversity, neurodiversity is a concept where neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. These differences can include those labeled with dyspraxia, dyslexia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, dyscalculia, I probably mispronounced that, autism spectrum, Tourette syndrome, and others. Some include left-handedness, transgender, and homosexuality in this definition. The rainbow-colored infinity symbol represents the diversity of the autism spectrum, as well as the greater neurodiversity movement. The word neurotypical is then the opposite of neurodivergent, which means being neurologically typical within the typical or average range for human neurology. Generally, autism is a difference in how the brain processes incoming sensory information. For some, loud noises can be painful. Others don't get enough sensory input, so repetitive motions are calming. The way that neurotypical people intuitively interact and communicate with body language and facial expressions is often lost on people with autism. Living in a world that is, for the most part, not designed for us can be difficult. There is a higher rate of depression and anxiety for those on the autism spectrum. But there are benefits, attention to detail, deep focus, strong ability to absorb and retain facts, visual skills, methodical and novel approaches to situations and problems, creativity, tenacity, accepting of people's differences and integrity. Now, I should clarify, this is not a talk about what autism is. I'm not an expert at diagnosing it. I'm only an expert on me. My experience will not be the same as other people on the spectrum. From a young age, I knew I was different, but I didn't know how or why. I was teased and bullied relentlessly all throughout elementary, middle, and high school. This is unfortunately all too common. Some would act like a friend to get close to me only to make fun of me. Sometimes this was behind my back, sometimes to my face. I could tell some of the time. The college was different. I made sure to go to a large school where from a large pool of students, I could find people I felt at least a little bit comfortable with. I still struggled to form relationships, but as long as someone else made the introduction, I was fine. Now, I always had enjoyed riding my bike, but I didn't realize bike racing was a thing until I got to college. After my first year, I used some of my summer job money and bought my first racing bike. This was actually a good sport for me. I was generally uncoordinated, so was horrible at the stick and ball sports. But bike racing mostly requires one to push oneself and endure the pain from aerobic exertion. There is some importance on bike handling, so in hindsight, it really wasn't surprising that I tended to crash in races a little more often than my teammates. In my sophomore year, I discovered there were study abroad programs for electrical engineering, and many of these were in Europe, where bike racing is far more popular. I needed some electives anyway, so I decided to learn French, and after taking intro and then conversational French courses, got accepted to a course, a program in Paris, where I would take EE courses. It was suggested I also do a summer program at another school with engineers to help me get acclimated. I then had a gap between these two programs. My professor suggested a three-week course at La Sorbonne. It was as if they didn't believe I could have learned French so fast. But to me, it was just pattern matching. 
eventually I got so practiced at it, I started to think in the other language. Of course, I also got on an amateur French bike racing team. After coming back to the US, completing my degree, my first full-time job involved a lot of soldering with a microscope, and being crouched over circuit boards and test probes. After a few years, I started having tension headaches that lasted all day. When I woke up the next day, the headache was still there. After an MRI of my brain showed nothing remarkable, a neurologist prescribed painkillers. That was fun for a while, but when I developed a tolerance to the meds, I knew I couldn't stay on that road. I next went to a clinic that specialized in headache treatment. We tried a few different medications, but ultimately biofeedback was the most effective. Electrodes are placed on the muscles and a display graphs the muscle tension. It took three sessions before I could even move the graphs. It's now been over 20 years that I've been struggling to keep the headaches in check. Occasionally it runs over into full on migraine with severe light and sound sensitivity and nausea, but I continue to use biofeedback, massage therapy, other relaxation techniques, and a few prescribed meds when I really need them. My therapist says that my muscle tension caused headaches are a learned response to the bullying I experienced. It's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. We're now working on lessening the effects of those memories. I moved to Colorado in the year 2000 to join a startup. Unfortunately, that company failed and everyone was laid off shortly after 9-11. I applied to every electrical engineering job there was within about a two hour drive. Eventually, even the twice extended federal emergency employment benefits were about to run out, but I still needed a job. I looked at what my other skills were. I could either work in a bike shop or maybe do car repair. I had tried bike racing when I got back from France, but my heart wasn't in it anymore. But eventually my new weekend hobby was autocrossing and track events. The amateur auto racing meant I spent a lot of time modifying and repairing cars. I also had several lab credits from school, from hybrid electric vehicle and solar powered car projects. So I got a job in a small independent repair shop while I waited for the economy to improve and searched for another engineering job. I'm really glad I got that experience. Since then, I'm over, I've only ever had to pay someone else for car repairs when the tools were cost prohibitive, such as suspension alignment. Years later, I started doing freelance web development and worked part-time while I stayed home with our infant son. I got a full-time position with a local web development agency when it was time for daycare. That job was in a small open office. Prior to that, in my engineering jobs, I either had a cube or even an office with my own door. But at the interview, I thought, I don't know about this, but let's give it a try. I wore in-ear monitors playing music at a low volume to block out all the sounds around me. I tried positioning my monitor so I could only see my work to not get distracted by other people moving about. That was really hard for me, and it took more and more out of me throughout the day, just to get through the day. Eventually I asked to work from home, but that request was denied. This was ironic as despite the open office, the CEO and two other employees had their own offices. After a few years, as the company grew, the office was remodeled to take over the adjacent space in the building. The new office was nice. We weren't so cramped, but being new construction, there was a lot of echo. This was particularly bad in the meeting rooms. I remember one day in a scrum meeting of four different projects, we're in, we were in a room with three nearly empty walls, a fourth all of glass, a concrete floor, and a steel ceiling. To say there was a lot of echo is an understatement. I was also frustrated at the time because while these meetings were efficient for the PM, each of the developers were just sitting there waiting for their turn while everything else was completely unrelated. I finally couldn't take it anymore and got up and walked out. The sound was just too painful. Sometime later, I asked about doing something about the echo in all the smaller rooms. A project manager had just purchased some sound absorbing materials. I waited and waited for that to be completed. Eventually some pyramid shaped foam pieces were stuck to one wall of one of the smallest rooms with some double-sided tape. They lasted a few days before they fell. By that point, I was kind of done. My mantra became, I'm just trying to get my work done. I also struggle when there's a lack of visual information. With one particular coworker, I found 
difficulty understanding them describe aspects of a code base I was taking over from them. I'm very much a visual learner. If information is only provided via spoken word, I'm going to have to ask a bunch of questions. You might have to explain things several times. But if there's some text, a diagram, or even just some code to look at, I'm fine. In college, I used to skip out on big lectures because I found I needed to take the time to read the textbook to really absorb things anyway. Doing both was inefficient. Our son is now 11 years old. He was diagnosed with autism when he was three. As I learned to help him, I started noticing similarities between us, and that got me curious. I found a therapist who confirmed the diagnosis. That was really an aha moment. As I read about autism, more and more of my past, my struggles, and my strengths made so much sense. That handbasket I'm in now is going down a good path. Many adults don't get diagnosed until later in life like me. That's because doctors have only recently gotten better at identifying the symptoms. Women are less often diagnosed because they tend to be better at masking their autism. People of color have it even worse. Elijah McLean and so many other black men with autism have been killed by police. And there are countless stories of young black and Hispanic children in school who are arrested after they have simply have difficulty controlling emotions. I do realize how much privilege I have, but I wonder how my life might've been different if I hypothetically could have been diagnosed at a young age. In many of my math and engineering courses, I found I would make simple mistakes when pressed for time in an exam. With an autism diagnosis, I could have been allowed more time. But with the tendency to shelter children on the spectrum, would I have done a study abroad program for a year? Unfortunately, even in this day and age, neurotypical people still hold and promote negative stereotypes about individuals who are neurodivergent. A recent example from the past year is from a former boss who was under some pressure to distance himself from a rather abusive and misogynistic person where they served on the board of a software foundation. He tried to explain it away, saying this person is on the spectrum. I really wanted to interrupt and make it clear that autism doesn't make one say misogynistic things. Being a misogynist does that. What I strive for is understanding. In an ideal world, differences such as autism would be treated with kindness, empathy, and respect, and seen as something along the lines as colorblindness, a non-standard way of existing in the world that doesn't mean one is damaged, just different. I hope to see employers implement accommodations in the workplace for people on the spectrum and for an end to the derogatory stereotypes and stigmas affecting autistic people. My most sincere wish is that when my son is old enough to follow his own career goals, that his differences are cherished and accepted the way that I cherish and accept them. Thank you. I guess we have any questions. Thank you so much for sharing your journey, John. Uh, I think we sure. really appreciate it. I'm gonna stop the recording.